All right, this is the third and final part of our uh, talk on distal femur fractures. I'm Saqib Rahman and I'm narrating. This is from the Orthopedic Trauma Association uh, Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, version three. Um, PowerPoint slides by Dr. Christ uh, with contributions from previous authors and other contributors. So, in our first uh, talk, we went through assessment, pre-op planning, uh, in the last uh, session, um, middle part of this PowerPoint, we went through um, some of the uh, internal fixation options such as retrograde nailing, uh, condylar plates, uh, DCS, blade plate. Um, now we're going to wrap things up by talking a little bit about locked plates and then a little bit on outcomes and then we'll end it. So, um, so Locked plates, the advantages are uh, they can be placed in a submuscular fashion. They can be placed percutaneously as well, as you can with condylar plates. Um, they're anatomically contoured, um, and that doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean one size fits all, but certainly there's an attempt to get it to fit. Uh, they can resist varus deformation, and this is the key. Uh, they're fixed angle devices like the condylar blade, and um, you will not have... Uh, uh, as high an incidence of that varus collapse like you get with a non-locked condylar plate, uh, especially when there's medial comminution. Uh, it can get much better fixation for osteopenic bone. Disadvantages are uh, the uh, some complexity of all the insertion equipment. Um, requires a little bit of knowledge of the system you're using. Um, you, if you're not careful, can cross-thread the screw plate interface and still could be difficult to avoid screw traffic uh, when you got all these uh, uh, compression screws for your articular surface, but with uh, variable angle locking, uh, that's gotten a little bit less of a problem. So here you can see some examples of uh, locked plates. You can see some of them can be placed with these uh, sort of like aiming devices uh, for screw placement. You can see here, you know, the 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 plate's been. Uh, you know, there's been an open incision distally and then proximally these are placed with uh, percutaneous screw insertion perhaps with this targeting device up top, okay? Um, lock plates can avoid difficulty encountered with stabilization of uh, coronal splits that were problematic with the blade, okay? Because placement of the screws is a lot less traumatic than jamming this, uh, jamming this blade in there. Um, so here you can see an example where there are multiple articular splits in the coronal and sagittal planes. Uh, the you know, other advantage is, you know, you can um, um, you can get around these screws. So for, here's an example where you have a um, you know joints has been reduced. You're in an external fixator uh, and a spanning knee X fix, uh, and then you can. Uh, go ahead and convert this to a locked plate and uh, this is like what I was saying like multi-directional uh, or variable angle uh, locked screws can get around those interfragmentary screws uh, and avoid that uh, screw traffic in, in this particular case you can see that was done um, keep in mind uh, be very nervous about what you're seeing on x-ray. Sometimes you can't judge coronal and sagittal plane alignment in that very small field of view. Uh, so zoom out whenever possible. Um, I like to use sometimes a, a goniometer intraoperatively to, to sort of be able to get a better sense of what my angulation is like. Uh, get long cassette views after provisional fixation if you're not sure. Uh, you can see an example intraoperatively of uh, uh, a long film being used to get a better sense of what the alignment really looked like. Okay, um, so uh, here's just uh, some of the very early locked plates. This is going back to 2004 uh, using the um, list plate, which is one of the first locked plates for distal femur fractures. Um, another paper from around the same time for distal femur fractures. So this caught on fairly early. Uh, and there have been many different iterations of locked plates, and uh, but uh, I think that most surgeons who use these will agree that they have been um, successful, especially at preventing varus collapse. You know, whether or not they're too rigid is, is another question. 
Uh, they can be successful in periprosthetic distal femur fractures. Okay, here's a paper by Bill Ritchie, um, also going back uh, some time. Uh, this is 10 years from uh, when I'm uh, narrating this to you, 10 years previously, but uh, this was a case series with uh, uh, fractures above a total knee and uh, locked plating can work uh, very nicely in that as well and still still is advantageous today. Biomechanical studies uh, in this particular study no difference in uh, um, axial load to failure between a list plate and a blade plate um, at least, uh, you know, I think what one thing we can say is that patients who have normal bone, uh, there's no particular advantage um, of having the locked screws proximally. So in patients with normal bone, often you can use cortical screws proximally. However, in osteoporosis, um, the uh, um, fixation of having locked screws is particularly helpful proximally. I think distally, they can be helpful in many, many cases. But proximally, um, often surgeons will go to a hybrid fixation where they put you know, cortical screws up here um, if they plan on bringing the shaft to the, to the plate. Um, or they can do an internal fixator technique where the plate is kept off the bone if they feel that the contour is going to uh, mal-reduce the, um, the fracture, for instance. Um, so here's the use of a uh, external fixator for indirect reduction, okay, highly comminuted uh, distal femur fracture. Um, here's after the uh, application of uh, um, sort of, you know, you have reduction of the articular surface. There's lag screws down there. You can see one right over here. And uh, then you have a long submuscular plate and you can see all this medial comminution that was left alone actually. Uh, and this actually uh, can go on to heal and could need bone grafting, all right? Uh, in this case, did not. So just a few words in general about the distal femur fracture literature. Um, uh, Non-unions are not totally rare. Um, fixation failure, depending what you're looking at, uh, I think with, with uh, you know, modern implants, uh, with the right technique for the right fracture, um, these can be generally successful uh, and go on to heal. Uh, infections are not quite as high as they are with periarticular tibial fractures, um, but secondary surgical procedures are not rare. Okay, and we, none of these cases or none of these case series are particularly large. I mean, this was from a uh, um, systematic review published in the journal Orthopedic Trauma about 10 years ago. Uh, what about uh, retrograde IM nails? Um, this more or less uh, reflects the literature, perhaps lower infections than with, um, than with plates. What about uh, compression plates? As I said, slightly higher infection rates, um, perhaps less need for secondary surgery. Um, and you can see these non-union rates across studies are around the same, not particularly high, although that's been questioned recently. So, in general, I think um, operative treatment is indicated for displaced distal femur fractures. Um, there are no huge differences between, I would say, intramedullary nailing and plating. Um, submuscular plating with, uh, with uh, lists or other locked plating versus conventional plates um, have uh, decreased infection rates, higher implant failure. Um, an increased surgeon experience in general, as it is with many, um, many fractures uh, of this complexity, will decrease the revision rate. Problem is we just don't have good enough uh, literature to make very definitive statements uh, regarding, um, you know, what is, the, what is the evidence for one particular treatment over another. Uh, but I hope that um, most of the principles shown in this uh, presentation at least help guide you in uh, how to manage your cases. So have a full understanding of the fracture anatomy, understand the benefits and limitations of each implant, okay? Uh, utilize the reduction techniques that are soft tissue friendly and beware of common pitfalls, especially regarding malreduction. 
All right, remember surgical technique rather than implant choice is the key here. I mean, with you know, retrograde nails, you, you can run into trouble without the right technique, but with, the, with good technique, uh, and someone who's very good with nailing, um, you can get better results than with plating and, and vice versa. Um, so thank you for your attention. I'm Saka Brahman narrating. Again, this is a slideshow for the Orthopedic Trauma Association, uh, authored by Dr. Christ and uh, previous authors. Thank you.